Great white sharks, nature's torpedoes, employ surprise attacks from the depths, blending speed with power. Their bites at humans, often mistaken identity, reflect curiosity rather than aggression, making actual attacks rare. These stories of encounters highlight the unlikely yet impactful nibbles from these misunderstood giants. In the year 1997, along the serene yet deceptive coastline of South Africa, an extraordinary and formidable presence cast a shadow over the celebrated marine beauty of the region. An immense great white shark, known for its rare size and unusual aggression, patrolled the waters, turning into a feared figure among those who navigated these seas. This creature, notable for its extraordinary size and unusual aggression, was a legend among the local seafarers, casting a shadow of fear over the otherwise peaceful waters. In the small, charming coastal town of Hermanus, renowned for its whale-watching and vibrant fishing community, the crew of the fishing vessel Serenity's Edge prepared for their daily sojourn into the sea. The ship's captain, the seasoned Jacobus van der Merwe, dismissed the tales of the monstrous shark as mere folklore designed to intimidate inexperienced sailors. He was joined by his trustworthy first mate Liam Botha, the ingenious engineer Siphon Kosi, and the eager deckhand Peter Gronewald. Each man, armed with his unique talents and motivations, was ready to brave the unpredictable sea. They embarked at dawn, with the sky painted in hues of orange and pink, signaling the hope of a prosperous day ahead. The sea was remarkably calm, and for hours the journey proceeded smoothly. The crew worked in perfect synergy, pulling in nets filled with their catch, reveling in the routine success of their venture. However, this peace was violently disrupted when an immense force suddenly struck the Serenity's edge. The legendary Great White Shark, the subject of whispered rumors among Hermanus's fishermen, attacked the boat with devastating force, tearing it in half. The sea became a whirlpool of chaos, filled with floating debris, equipment, and fish, as water flooded the gaping hole in the vessel's side. In the wake of the attack, the crew was seized by panic. Captain Jacobus, maintaining his composure, rallied his men, emphasizing the need for survival as their boat began to sink. Stranded amid the wreckage, they realized they faced a twofold threat. Not only the merciless sea, but also the great white shark, which seemed to view them with a cold, predatory interest. With their fishing boat destroyed and rescue far off, the men were forced to face the harsh reality of their situation. Clinging to remnants of Serenity's Edge for flotation, they confronted the dual dangers of the cold and the prowling shark. Jacobus encouraged his crew, stressing the importance of unity and calm in their dire situation. In the wake of a devastating assault that cleaved their ship in half, the sailors found themselves in dire straits, isolated amidst the vast sea with a mammoth great white shark stalking them. Initially overwhelmed by turmoil and dread, Captain Jacobus van der Merwe quickly understood that their chances of survival hinged on their ability to stay composed and formulate a cunning strategy to thwart the shark's encroachments and last until help could reach them. Realizing that being in the water heightened their risk, the first strategic move by the sailors was to limit their time submerged. They salvaged wreckage and debris from the Serenity's Edge, cobbling together an improvised raft to stay as out of the water as possible. This maneuver not only shielded them from the chill, but also lessened the odds of drawing the shark's gaze. Drawing from his deep-seated knowledge and experiences with sharks, Captain Jacobus advised his crew to eschew sudden or splashy movements which might lure the shark. They were to act with intention and silence, conserving energy and diminishing their footprint in the shark's realm. The crew resorted to a technique scarcely tried but often whispered among seafarers known as shark smudging. This entailed utilizing fish remnants from their previous catch scattered in the debris to concoct a thin trail of scent leading away from their raft. The aim was to baffle the shark's olfactory senses and divert it from them, securing precious time and distance. To ensure unity, they fastened themselves to the raft and one another with ropes found in the ship's remnants. This practice not only kept them from being separated, but also presented a collective bulk that might appear more intimidating to the shark, potentially dissuading it from striking. During the night, they took turns on the lookout, mindful of the fact that sharks tend to be more aggressive during twilight and dawn. The lookouts would softly tap the water's surface with debris, 
generating vibrations intended to keep the shark at bay, predicated on the belief that sharks could be wary of consistent and unfamiliar disturbances. As the temperature dropped, they drew close for warmth, repurposing any materials at hand for insulation. This was crucial for fending off the cold and for keeping their spirits and alertness high, essential when their defense strategies needed swift execution. To fend off despair and maintain a hopeful outlook, they exchanged tales of their personal lives, concentrating on uplifting narratives and the anticipation of rescue. This psychological approach was pivotal for managing their fears and sustaining a mindset geared toward survival, vital for overcoming the psychological hurdles posed by their plight. With the break of day, when glimpses of the shark's outline became sporadic, the crew undertook a daring yet measured gambit. They used a shiny piece of debris to cast abrupt beams of light, aiming to bewilder and disorient the shark. This innovative tactic, predicated on the hypothesis that sudden stimuli can deter sharks, granted them brief intervals to regroup and strategize. Understanding the necessity of signaling for assistance, they crafted a signal for distress using vibrantly colored garments and reflective items. By affixing these to the raft's highest point, they enhanced their visibility to passing vessels and aircraft. In an ultimate display of resourcefulness, they converted the battery from the boat's emergency beacon, salvaged from the ruins into a primitive spark creator. This enabled them to light a small fire on a metal platform, sending smoke signals by day and serving as a beacon by night. Their collective endeavors, spanning the physical, mental, and emotional realms, wove a fabric of camaraderie that stood as their paramount asset. Each strategy, from the pragmatic to the psychological, was bolstered by a mutual resolve to survive and a profound grasp of the adversities they confronted, not solely from the shark but from the ocean's vast expanse. The arrival of the rescue helicopter on the horizon was not merely a sign of their physical endurance, but a tribute to their indomitable spirit, strategic wisdom, and steadfast desire to prevail. The saga of the Serenity's Edge crew emerged as a stirring narrative of human creativity and tenacity against one of nature's most fearsome creatures. Following their rescue, the individuals saved from Serenity's Edge were immediately engulfed in a storm of healthcare services, marked by both a sense of urgency and a detailed focus on their specific needs. As soon as they were on board the rescue helicopter, a specialized medical team leaped into action, providing first aid that was both groundbreaking and highly effective. This initial treatment merged age-old medical insights with the latest advancements, aiming to stabilize their conditions amid the noise of the helicopter blades. They were swaddled in sophisticated thermal blankets combining reflective materials with low-power electric heating, carefully restoring their body temperatures to normal to counteract the hypothermia that had trapped them with its cold, unseen grip. To address dehydration and imbalances in electrolytes, IV fluids, heated to just the right temperature, were given alongside immediate, reassuring psychological support to soothe their shaken spirits. Upon landing, the rescued crew was rapidly transported to a medical facility, where a team with varied specialties but a singular focus awaited. There, the healthcare provided went beyond the standard. Wounds were treated with dressings infused with nanotechnology to speed up healing and fend off infections, taking advantage of the body's natural healing processes while protecting against external dangers. For those with more serious cuts or injuries, an innovative method using a biodegradable adhesive hydrogel was used, closing wounds accurately and fostering tissue growth without stitches. The mental health support was just as pioneering. The individuals were introduced to a virtual reality therapy regimen crafted to help them navigate their traumatic experiences in a supportive, regulated setting. This personalized program used immersive environments to assist them in working through their trauma, fostering mental toughness and healing. Throughout their healing journey, the Serenity's Edge crew members were treated not merely as patients, but as trailblazers in the realm of trauma recovery, benefiting from a mix of empathy, innovation, and scientific knowledge. This strategy not only tackled their immediate physical and psychological injuries, but also established a solid foundation for a thorough recovery of both mind and body. Their rescue signaled not the conclusion of their harrowing experience, but the start of their path to wellness steered by some of the most sophisticated healthcare methodologies available. The tale of the Serenity's Edge crew's survival against a colossal shark captivated the nation, 
becoming a symbol of human endurance and the unpredictable might of nature. For Jacobus, Liam, Sipho, and Peter, this ordeal was a pivotal moment. This trial forged an unbreakable bond among them. The rogue Great White, the catalyst of their near demise, remained at large, its myth only amplified with each retelling. This event underscored the profound mysteries and hazards lurking in the ocean's depths, demanding respect and invoking fear in those brave enough to traverse its waters. In the large expanse of the Pacific Ocean, a remote and unspoiled haven lay hidden, far removed from any trace of human touch. It was a realm of both refuge and confinement. In the year 1998, the Sable Mirage Isle was set to unfold a gripping saga of endurance and foreboding, with Michael Harris, a 34-year-old individual at its heart, whose existence was on the brink of an extraordinary transformation. Michael Harris could hardly grasp the sequence of events that had led to his current predicament, lying breathless on the virgin sands of a forsaken tropical isle. Merely days before, he was a passenger on the SS Marigold, a merchant vessel traversing the Pacific. Out of the blue, a storm of mythical proportions struck, reducing the formidable ship to wreckage. Michael recalled the turmoil, the cries of despair, the struggle against the inevitable, followed by the chilling embrace of the deep sea. He regained consciousness under the fierce glare of the sun, with the monotonous crash of waves as his welcome. The island was a stark contrast to the barren sea, it offered potential shelter, sustenance, and perhaps a slim chance of being rescued. Unbeknownst to Michael, the island also concealed a menace as persistent and lethal as the storm that had cast him ashore. The initial days blurred into a fight for survival. With no skills in wilderness survival, Michael, a professional accountant, depended on fragmented recollections from films and literature to locate drinking water and food and construct a basic shelter. The seemingly abandoned island teemed with life. Birds chorused from the treetops, fish glided in the translucent waters, and trees bore fruit in abundance. Yet this idol was not without its dark aspects. On the third day, during an exploration of the island's edge, Michael encountered a chilling sight. The sleek, unmistakable fins of tiger sharks cutting through the shallows. This realization chilled him to the bone. The island was not just isolated. It was a fortress encircled by some of the most formidable predators nature had concocted. As weeks replaced days, Michael's initial hope for swift rescue faded. Aircraft soared at great altitudes, too distant to notice a solitary figure on an unmarked island. The shark-ridden waters rendered any escape attempts by raft recklessly optimistic. Nevertheless, survival necessitated adaptability. Michael mastered shallow water fishing, sidestepping the deeper regions where the sharks prowled. He collected rainwater, erected a sturdier shelter, and after countless failed attempts, kindled a fire using the bow drill technique. His existence settled into a rhythm marked by moments of awe and dread. Some sunsets set the sky ablaze, nights alive with the jungle's symphony and the constant menace of sharks, which seemed to scorn his captivity from beyond the breakers. A pivotal discovery altered everything. While foraging in the dense jungle for sustenance, Michael stumbled upon the relics of an ancient campsite. Among the deteriorated equipment and weather-worn bones, a journal encased in a plastic bag emerged. It belonged to Jonathan Edwards, a biologist who had ventured to the island two decades earlier to study the tiger sharks. The journal detailed observations of the sharks' habits and dietary patterns and, crucially, hypothesized a safe route through the reefs, potentially leading to open waters. Armed with this newfound knowledge, Michael set to work. He understood the odds stacked against him, but the journal offered a flicker of hope, a chance at freedom. He commenced constructing a raft far more durable than he had ever envisioned possible. He amassed supplies, mapped the reef's passage by monitoring the sharks, and awaited an opportune moment. That moment arrived with a dawn so serene it seemed prophetic. At first light, Michael nudged his raft into the surf, his heart thumping wildly. The sharks, ever present, showed an unusual disinterest. Guided by Jonathan's notes, he steered through the perilous reef passage. The sharks circled but maintained their distance as if acknowledging his audacity. As he reached the open sea, the island dwindled to a dot behind him, and Michael allowed himself to hope. He had outlasted the island its sharks, and the ocean's vastness. The path ahead was fraught with uncertainty. 
The rescue needed to be assured, but he had achieved the unattainable. Weeks later, Michael Harris was rescued by a passing merchant ship, his raft bearing witness to his indomitable spirit. He returned transformed, bearing the saga of his trial and the insights gained. Following his remarkable rescue, Michael Harris embarked on a significant path of healing and self-discovery. Adjusting to life back in society posed its set of hurdles. At the same time, physical reminders of his ordeal were evident. It was the mental and emotional aftermath that required immense fortitude to overcome. Michael turned to therapy, a sanctuary where he delved into the depths of his trauma, the solitude, and the continuous struggle for existence that had defined his time stranded. Writing became an unexpected source of solace for him, allowing him to pour his experiences into a memoir. This endeavor not only provided a means of personal healing, but also sought to motivate others facing their adversities. By participating in support groups for survivors, Michael found a sense of belonging and purpose, offering guidance to others on their paths to recovery. His trial had stripped him to his core, revealing to him the essence of persistence, the splendor found in the resilience of the human spirit, and the incredible power of embracing one's vulnerabilities. In rebuilding his existence, Michael Harris didn't merely survive the harsh realities of the island. He rose as a symbol of hope for others, exemplifying the relentless human capacity to triumph over seemingly impossible odds. His ordeal became a symbol of hope, exemplifying the profound resilience inherent in the human spirit when confronted with the inconceivable. The island, in its splendor and peril, remained untouched, a silent testament to the relentless human will against nature's might. In the tranquil yet vivid vastness of the Caribbean Sea, enveloped in the night's embrace, began the extraordinary expedition of Sofia Moreno. The calendar marked the year 2002, placing the scene near the wondrous depths of the Cayman Trench, celebrated for its awe-inspiring underwater vistas and the secrets buried beneath. Sophia, a dauntless and seasoned explorer beneath the waves, had been drawn since youth by the lore of sunken vessels scattered across this seabed. Her quest was to unveil the Esperanza, a ship lost to the waves in the twilight of the 19th century under enigmatic conditions. Legends whispered of Esperanza's cargo, believed to be laden with invaluable relics and treasures. Yet its precise resting place remained a puzzle unsolved by fortune seekers and scholars for generations. This voyage to the Caribbean was fueled not solely by Sophia's thirst for the uncharted and the depths, but also by a desire to weave through the tapestry of her lineage. Rumors had long circulated in her family that her ancestor was Esperanza's captain, and she was nurtured on narratives of his voyages and the doomed expedition that sealed the ship's fate. Equipped with the latest historical insights and advanced navigational tools, Sophia was convinced she was on the verge of piercing the veil shrouding the shipwreck's mysteries. As daylight waned, surrendering the sky to shades of orange and violet, Sophia readied herself for the descent. The dive spot was eerily serene, disturbed only by the rhythmic kiss of waves against her vessel. A final review of her gear, oxygen canisters, a beacon of light for the path ahead, a camera to immortalize the deep's wonders and a blade for safety. Well aware of the night dive's inherent risks, she also armed herself with a sonar tech, hoping it would unveil the ocean floor's contours and alert her to the presence of any lurking leviathans. Plunging into the abyss, Sophia's light pierced the darkness, revealing a kaleidoscope of corals and bustling marine life unique to the Caribbean's embrace. The further she ventured, the chill of the deep's caress replaced the surface's warmth. With each paddle, excitement and a dash of apprehension surged within her, drawing her nearer to her ambition, and possibly the perils hidden in the depths. Her sonar device's abrupt alert hinted at a significant discovery nearby. Heart racing, she pondered if the Esperanza was finally within reach. However, the shadows soon unveiled a formidable bull shark, its gaze reflecting an eerie luminescence. Known for their aggressiveness, this guardian of the deep seemed to encircle the wreck with proprietary zeal, suggesting it had claimed this patch of the abyss as its own. The encounter with the shark presented Sophia with a critical juncture. With her oxygen dwindling and the path to the Esperanza obstructed by one of the ocean's fiercest predators, the darkness seemed to grow denser, amplifying her isolation. Yet retreating was a choice Sophia refused to entertain. 
The drive to explore Esperanza and honor her forebear's memory steeled her resolve. In the dim ocean depths, Sophia's continued existence hinged on her ability to blend into the environment and her deep insight into the behaviors of sea creatures. Faced with a circling bull shark, she remembered that sharks were often less likely to notice prey that remained calm and quiet. Sophia made sure to limit her movements, controlling her breathing to reduce bubble production, a key indicator of her location. She skillfully used the sunken ship as a natural shield, moving through its remains to disrupt her outline against the vast openness of the sea. By positioning herself in a way that any scent she might emit was carried away from the shark by the current, she became harder to detect. This approach, along with her cautious and measured actions, decreased her chances of being seen as potential prey. After a few nerve-wracking moments watching the shark survey the edges of the wreck, the creature eventually seemed to lose interest in Sophia's area, possibly detecting no clear prey or being lured away by another distraction. The formidable sea predator quietly moved off into the gloom, leaving Sophia to continue her underwater journey, her pulse racing from the thrill of having cleverly avoided an encounter with one of the sea's most impressive predators. In her delicate dance through the deep, Sophia's reverence for the oceanic realm and its denizens guided her every maneuver. She treaded these waters not as a conqueror but as a humble visitor, captivated by its splendor even amidst danger. The bull shark in its grandeur was woven into the fabric of her tail, a living symbol of the fine line that adventurers walk between discovery and jeopardy. Upon finally beholding the Esperanza, its form shrouded in coral and teeming with life, Sophia's heart swelled with achievement. She meticulously documented the wreck, gathering evidence that would later validate the ship's identity and chronicle. Her mission was a success, but the encounter with the bull shark lingered prominently in her mind, a stark reminder of adventure's dual-edged nature. Rising to the surface as dawn's first light reclaimed the sky, Sophia was transformed by her expedition, enriched by the tangible and intangible treasures she had unearthed. This journey deepened her bond with the mysteries of the sea, and she knew the tale of her brush with the bull shark would be recounted for years, a narrative of respect, fear, and an indomitable spirit's quest into the unknown. In the stark and boundless waters of the Arctic, close to the shores of Greenland, it was the year 2015. The exploration ship, known as the Aurora Borealis, was a fortress designed to breach the ice-filled seas, sheltering a group of devoted scientists. This group, under the guidance of Dr. Alexander Hart, embarked on a journey to scrutinize the impact of climate alteration on the fragile ecosystem of the Arctic. Alongside Alexander was the marine expert Dr. Sophia Morales, the climate specialist Dr. Ethan Wright, and a team of proficient sailors and research aides. This vessel, the Aurora Borealis, had transformed into their sanctuary and study hub, outfitted with state-of-the-art apparatus to track environmental shifts and aquatic life. Yet as they delved deeper into the icy solitude, they unknowingly trespassed into the realm of a being as venerable as the ice itself, a colossal Greenland shark. The Greenland territory at the junction of the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans was a realm of stark contrasts. Its expansive ice fields and the surrounding cold waters were as magnificent as they were ruthless. The team had selected this spot for its pivotal role in climate change research, as it was among the rare locales on the globe where one could observe Greenland sharks in their native surroundings. These sharks, secretive behemoths of the abyss, were infrequently observed yet held in high esteem through local folklore. Known for their centuries-long lifespan, they glided silently under the ice, embodying the wild and untamed spirit of the Arctic. The narrative unfolded as the Aurora Borealis made its way through an especially thick ice pack. The researchers were thrilled, having amassed invaluable insights over the preceding weeks. However, their enthusiasm quickly turned to concern when an unexpected shift in the ice entrapped the vessel. The ice, clamping around them like a vice, immobilized the ship. As the team devised their next steps, a minor mishap led to a crew member sustaining an injury. It was a trivial cut, Yet in the Arctic silence, the scent of blood traveled far under the ice. It was this very scent that roused the ancient predator from its slumber. Attracted by the hint of easy prey, the Greenland shark began to encircle the immobilized vessel. 
Invisible but ever-present, its approach was slow, calculated, and terrifyingly patient. Dr. Alexander Hart, with his weathered beard and eyes that had witnessed countless storms, pondered their predicament. Sophia, with her profound understanding of marine life, noted the shift in underwater currents. Ethan, with his unmatched climate insight, realized the ice would not release its grip easily. Confronted with a critical choice, the team deliberated. Awaiting rescue was akin to playing dice with their lives, but to traverse the ice and enter the water meant facing the very essence of Arctic peril. They chose to forge a pathway through the ice, an arduous and hazardous task, but their sole chance at freedom. As they toiled, the shark loomed, a sinister specter beneath the ice. The crew, aware of the lurking danger, advanced with urgency and caution, their progress slow yet persistent. The Arctic, with its awe-inspiring beauty, remained indifferent to their plight. The aurora borealis illuminated the skies, casting otherworldly lights over the ice, starkly contrasting the gloom that lay beneath. The tension within the team was tangible, each member conscious that every disturbance could draw the predator's gaze. Nonetheless, they pressed on, driven by a desire to survive and the bonds forged through shared trials. Approaching the icefield's perimeter, the shark made its presence unmistakably felt. A vast, menacing shadow glided beneath the fragile ice underfoot. Its mere sight, even through the opaque water, sent chills through them. The inevitable confrontation they had wished to evade was upon them. Yet this was no ordinary adversary, and they were no ordinary foes. They were scholars endowed with knowledge and an appreciation for the natural world that few could claim. They acknowledged the risks of their venture but also understood that survival in the Arctic demanded respect for all its residents, even the most formidable. In an age-old ballet, humans and sharks circled one another, each evaluating the other's strength and intentions. The researchers, leveraging their grasp of marine behaviors, sought to dissuade the shark, generating vibrations in the water that mimicked those of a larger predator as daylight faded into the Arctic night's perpetual twilight. The researchers, having navigated the shifting ice with great effort, were physically and mentally exhausted. Their survival tactics, while successful, exacted a toll. Dr. Alexander Hart, who had steered the team with unwavering composure, endured frostbite on his hands, a direct consequence of handling ropes and tools in sub-zero temperatures, and his gloves were compromised during the intensive labor. Sophia Morales exhibited bruises and a significant laceration on her leg, evidence of a dangerous slip on the ice while transporting scientific gear across the treacherous surface. Ethan Wright, in his attempt to generate noise diversions for the shark, inadvertently lured a seal, resulting in a frantic episode that left him with a sprained ankle and several abrasions. Their strategy afforded them critical time, enabling them to reach a more stable ice flow. From this point, they signaled for assistance, their distress flares cutting through the twilight. Rescue arrived as the ice shifted once more, this time creating a passage for the Aurora Borealis. The researchers were salvaged, their mission was incomplete, but their lives were preserved. The shark, its curiosity quenched, vanished into the depths, leaving behind a narrative that would echo through the ages. Despite their injuries, the team's morale was uplifted by the arrival of the rescue helicopters, their rotors a comforting sound amidst the Arctic's quietude. The rescuers, adept in polar operations, promptly evaluated the situation and administered first aid. They employed stretchers for those incapacitated, ensuring everyone's safe transfer to the helicopters. When they came back, the researchers received medical attention commensurate with the severity of their injuries. Alexander's frostbite was treated with debridement, luckily without long-term repercussions. Sophia's wound needed suturing and vigilant infection prevention, a frequent hazard in polar settings. Ethan's ankle, though sprained, was not fractured as initially feared, and he was advised to rest and rehabilitation for a complete recovery. The physical recovery was merely one facet of their ordeal. The psychological aftermath of their encounter with the Greenland shark their survival struggle in one of Earth's most relentless environments and the acknowledgement of their frailty left indelible marks on each of them. Yet it also cemented a bond stronger than the ice that had trapped them. In the weeks and months that followed, they leaned on each other through the recovery process, exchanging their stories and the wisdom gained. Reflecting on their ordeal, the team recognized a profound lesson beyond their scientific pursuits. 
the formidable force of nature and the fragile equilibrium that governs life in the Arctic. Their experience not only tested their physical endurance, but also intensified their commitment to protecting these remote and vulnerable ecosystems. Dr. Alexander Hart, Dr. Sophia Morales, and Dr. Ethan Wright returned to their respective disciplines with a refreshed sense of purpose. Their brush with the Greenland shark reinforced the need for respect and caution in human engagements with the natural realm. Their Arctic escapade became a testament to the challenges faced by explorers of the unknown, a reminder of the simultaneous beauty and peril inherent in the natural world. As the Aurora Borealis departed from Greenland's shores, its crew cast a final glance at the ice, aware they had left behind a piece of themselves, interwoven with the timeless epic of the Arctic. The year was 2013, and amidst the boundless expanse of the Indian Ocean, there existed a marvel unrealized by civilization, a coral sanctuary of unparalleled grandeur. Termed Serenity's Cradle by the indigenous populace, this underwater was pulsated with life, a symphony of hues dancing beneath the azure canopy. Yet beneath this tranquil facade, a saga of endurance was etched into the annals of those daring enough to delve into its recesses. Here was Alexandra, Alex Jennings, a youthful marine scholar consumed by an insatiable ardor for the wonders of the deep. Serenity's cradle beckoned her with a siren call, presenting an opportunity to unravel the wondrous dance of climate change upon coral reefs. Armed with her scientific apparatus, Alex plunged into the heart of the reef, oblivious to the ordeal that awaited her, one that would test her mettle beyond the realms of academia. As the sun's golden tendrils caressed the reef, Alex found herself trapped by the aquatic spectacle. Shoals of iridescent fish moved around her, their chromatic scales reflecting the sun's radiance. She marveled at the coral's vibrancy, a testament to vitality yet also a sad harbinger of the delicate equilibrium within these aqueous realms. Yet tranquility swiftly transmuted into turmoil. A cohort of reef sharks drawn by unseen currents descended upon Alex with predatory intent. In the labyrinthine confines of the reef, escape routes dwindled, and her erstwhile fascination metamorphosed into dread. The sharks, typically aloof toward humans, exhibited unprecedented aggression. Bereft of functional equipment and cut off from surface communication, Alex found herself perilously exposed. Alex's struggle for survival would become a parable of the sea's erratic nature. Leveraging her understanding of marine behavior, she eschewed panic, recognizing that erratic movements would only exacerbate her predicament. Drawing upon her knowledge of the shark's sensory acumen, she adopted a strategy of stillness, minimizing her presence against the reef's backdrop. Minutes stretched forever, the shark circling a relentless reminder of mortality's specter. Through a blend of ingenuity and sheer resolve, Alex carefully charted her path to salvation, exploiting the reef's contours to obfuscate her presence. Each movement was a calculated gambit to evade detection. Eventually, the sharks, deeming her neither a threat nor quarry, dispersed, allowing Alex to breach the water's surface, gasping for the precious elixir of life. Upon the solid ground, the crucible of Serenity's cradle transformed Alex galvanizing within her an unyielding commitment to exploring the depths of marine predation and its ecological repercussions. Her harrowing odyssey, disseminated through scholarly circles and media conduits alike, cast her as an emissary for the delicate equilibrium of oceanic ecosystems. Returning to her vocation with renewed zeal, Alex embarked on a crusade to unravel the intricacies of predator-prey dynamics in coral ecosystems. Her hypothesis posited a link between aggressive predation and broader environmental perturbations. Her scholarly endeavors garnered global acclaim, fostering support for a sweeping inquiry into the plight of imperiled coral bastions worldwide. Simultaneously, Alex emerged as an ardent advocate for oceanic conservation, her voice resonating across international forums and documentary platforms. Her message was unmistakable. The ocean's splendor veils a world imperiled, its denizens motivated by survival rather than hostility. Time marched inexorably onward, and Alex's contributions to marine scholarship earned her laurels aplenty. Yet the specter of Serenity's cradle lingered in her consciousness, a tableau of triumph amidst tribulation awaiting resolution. Fueled by an indomitable spirit and an imperative need for closure, 
Alex orchestrated a return to the Indian Ocean's depths. This time, she went in the company of seasoned divers and scholars, each a luminary in their respective fields. Their mission transcended mere inquiry. It sought to encapsulate the majesty and fragility of the reef, kindling a global outcry against climate-induced perils. As the team delved anew into Serenity's cradle, Alex was engulfed by a maelstrom of emotions. Amidst the kaleidoscopic profusion of coral life, she sensed a kinship, an ineffable communion with the subaqueous realm. Their endeavors bore fruit as signs of regeneration manifested within the reef's precincts. Coral bleaching receded and once dwindling species experienced a resurgence. This testament to resilience invigorated Alex's optimism for the future. The denouement arrived amidst a fortuitous dive where Alex found herself yet another time amidst a congregation of reef predators. Yet this encounter diverged markedly from its predecessor. Armed with newfound comprehension and reverence, Alex beheld the sharks with awe rather than trepidation. Their languid circling bore witness to an unspoken accord between humanity and the abyssal domain. Emerging from the depths, Alex embraced the epiphany that this communion symbolized. Her journey had come full circle, from the throes of adversity to the vanguard of conservation. The lessons gleaned from Serenity's cradle would serve as her lodestar, guiding her crusade to safeguard the oceanic tapestry and its residents. In the years to come, Alexandra Jennings's legacy would be etched in the annals of marine conservation. Her saga, a fusion of survival, scholarship, and advocacy, stands as a clarion call for humanity's stewardship of the natural world. Amid the Mediterranean area where the chromatic heavens merged seamlessly with the sea, lay an enchanting island celebrated for its translucent waters and lively underwater realm. The summer of 1992 was a season of peak fascination for this haven, attracting a mix of adventurers and those in pursuit of serenity to its idyllic beaches. Among the island's guests were Lucas Thompson, his sibling Nathan, and their lifelong companion Marcus DeLuca. The trio, navigating their late twenties, sought refuge from the drudgery of their routine professional lives, finding solace in the boundless freedom offered by the sea. Their agenda was straightforward, to immerse themselves in the Mediterranean's welcoming waters for a day of snorkeling, hoping to uncover the hidden marvels beneath its surface. As dawn broke, bathing the island in a warm, golden light, the friends, armed with snorkeling gear, stepped into the refreshing embrace of the sea. They ventured further from land, buoyed by a sense of exhilaration, oblivious to the dramatic shift their journey was about to undertake. Beneath them, the sea thrived with a vibrant tableau of life. Fish swarmed amongst the corals, and the ocean floor presented a kaleidoscope of colors. Yet as they delved deeper, the environment transformed. The waters turned chillier, the sun's rays struggled to reach them, and the lively shallows gave way to the silent, deeper waters. It was in this serene yet eerie depth that they first noticed something unsettling. Initially, the shadows they spotted seemed mere silhouettes of large fish, perhaps curious of the newcomers. However, as time progressed, these shadows took on a more sinister form. A cold realization washed over the trio. They were not alone. Surrounding them were not mere fish, but sharks, gliding through the water with unsettling ease. Panic ensued. Despite their proficiency in swimming, they understood their disadvantage in the open sea, especially encircled by a group of sharks. Their initial desperate attempts to return to shore were chaotic, inadvertently drawing the sharks' attention. In the face of mounting danger, Lucas recalled a piece he had read on maintaining calm around sharks to avoid rapid movements that could incite an attack. Sharing this knowledge with Nathan and Marcus, they attempted to regulate their breathing and pace their movements focusing on conserving energy for the lengthy swim back. The return to the shore tested their limits, with every shadow and ripple sending waves of terror through their weary bodies. Yet with each stroke, they reminded one another of the life that awaited them beyond the sea, their families, aspirations, and the sheer joy of being on solid ground again. When the shore's sandy bed finally came into view, it brought with it a glimmer of hope, they emerged from the sea transformed, no longer the light-hearted vacationers they once were, but survivors, united by an ordeal that would forever shape their existence. 
In an astounding turn of events, the group of three had emerged from their dire predicament without a mark on them. Their careful strategy and unwavering determination to survive played a crucial role in their safe passage through dangerous waters and encircling threats. This escape, untouched and intact, not only intensified their survival narrative, but also shed light on the exceptional conditions under which they maintained their calm and unity. The fact that they came out physically unharmed from such a hazardous scenario brought an element of wonder to their remarkable tale, further strengthening their connection and deepening their reverence for the ocean's formidable powers. Their return, unscathed, stood as a symbol of their endurance and a glimmer of hope, illustrating that even in the most dangerous moments, solidarity and tranquility can pave the way to extraordinary escapes. The shark encounter emerged as a defining episode in the lives of Lucas, Nathan, and Marcus. It reshaped them, instilling a profound appreciation for life's delicate nature and the depth of their friendship. Their story, shared among both islanders and visitors, served as a vivid reminder of the respect the sea commands. A narrative of exhilaration, fear, and ultimately victory, underscoring that even amidst life's most dangerous currents, the essence of humanity can endure. This ordeal in the Mediterranean remained an unforgettable chapter in their lives, recounted with a blend of dread and admiration. It stood as a narrative of perseverance against all odds, a celebration of friendship's lasting power, and the unpredictable interplay between humanity and the natural world. The sea with all its splendor and perils now occupies a sacred place in their hearts, a testament to the day they gazed into the abyss and emerged with their lives forever changed.